Randy Schultz was focused on showing that the institutions that had been created to respond to this very type of, of tragedy failed to respond because of the prejudice against the people who were suffering from the disease. And that was the motivation behind his book. By the time President Reagan delivered his first address on AIDS in May 31st of this year at that AIDS fundraiser here in, in Georgetown, 36,000 Americans were dead or dying of this disease. What a sad statement that is, that that many people could be dead or dying before the president will even give a speech on the subject. The Times, the New York Times, within the next something like 15 days had 11 stories on the book, 11 articles in two weeks on a book that they had refused to review. The band played on, essentially broke the silence. That was the most important thing the book did. It, it basically cracked that wall of silence. But at the same time, Schultz engages in his own demonizing. And I find particularly unfortunate his demonizing of the Canadian flight attendant, Gaetan Dugas, whom he transforms in the course of his book into patient zero. And really, that idea of patient zero as a figure, as a popular term, comes from and the band played on. It's funny how much the patient zero narrative almost jumps out from the rest of the book. It does seem tacked on. It does, it does seem very opportunistic and very sensationalistic. My take on Schultz's construction of Gaetan Dugas in the book is that Schultz presents him to be someone who is completely uncaring about how his behavior might affect other people. It's an act of projection, I think, on the author's part. He takes his own anger and rage and bitterness, and he makes this character called Patient Zero. What Randy was doing was saying, yes, we are, you know, fucking ourselves crazy, and we are mindless, you know, hed hedonistically. You know, some of that is, a little bit of it is credible, and some of it is internalized homophobia, a real degree of it is internalized homophobic. There isn't any gay person who doesn't reveal this. And, did, and Randy certainly had his, his share of all this. So the idea that gay men were going out and intentionally giving the disease, it wasn't that. It was that sex was one of the few joys that people had in life. And so the idea, and it was very widespread, that whatever is causing this, I already have. And you probably have it too. This is the main reason why a lot of gay men didn't adopt and embrace safe sex practices when it came out, because everyone believed it was already too late. It wasn't this dark, evil portrait that, that Randy came up with. There was one part in the book where he was at a steam bath with someone, and at the end of their sexual act, he said, I've got gay cancer, and now you're going to get it too. And that struck me as very unlike the Gaetan that I knew. Did Gaetan really knew he was uh, spreading something? Uh, I can tell you one thing. If Gaetan knew he, he had, that he was killing somebody, by having sex with them, he would, he, he, he would not have done it. Uh, he, he would have stopped having sex with whoever. If he, if he knew exactly, no. That's, that's not the person that I know. Gaetan was not like that. He was charming and everything, but very, very caring. No way, there's no way he would have continue this. I, I didn't blame Gaetan. You know, had I become HIV positive, I, I never went through a period where I blamed Gaetan uh, for that because at that time, again, I don't think people really understood. And at the time as well, it wasn't, everything wasn't lumped into one thing. It was you had Kaposi sarcoma and they were trying to figure out why some people had that. And you had PCP and some people were, and they were trying to figure out why some people had that. And they hadn't connected all the dots yet that it was all one thing. Um, so I didn't, I don't think I ever went through a period where I blamed him.
So the original cluster study, and there's a very famous graphic showing everything pointing to this one individual, really, I think, spoke to the general public that there was a, a typhoid Mary type syndrome, a patient zero syndrome going on. So the, here's the key issue is what's sometimes called latency period or incubation period. It's the time from infection to when you get sick, right? So if you read the cluster study, the assumption there is the time from infection to when you get sick is of the order of two years. So okay, two years, that's the time. So they constructed this diagram in which Gaetan is linked to all these people by having had sex with them within approximately two years of their diagnosis. Okay. So, okay, two years, good. Because no one thought at the time that this was a virus that takes on average 10 years to, to produce symptoms. When you see somebody sick with AIDS, what you're seeing is the result of something that happened 10 years before. And when you see somebody in their mid-80s, where we now were, it's the result of getting infected in the mid-70s. And that's true. That's what happened. So this was like a slow-motion epidemic that had taken place in the past, and what we were seeing was a result of that. So this cluster is nonsense. Because if A infects B, B is not going to get sick for 10 years. And if B gets sick within two years of A, then you know for sure that A didn't infect him. It's the opposite of what it appears to say. Patients here, Gaetan Dugas, did not infect those people. That's not true. That's false. Dugas is at the center of a cluster of people who are impacted by HIV. That part of it is true. But if you move the dial over left or right five or 10 degrees, you're going to find someone else who's at the center of a cluster that just starts over again because of their context. If every individual had been able to recall the information to the same quality that Gaetan had and had been willing to share it, this image would look completely different. There was just so much uh, blaming of communities uh, at that point, the gay community, of, of, of course, or gay male uh, community trying to find an other otherness bringing it here from otherwhere, you know, and he was Mr. Otherwhere, you know, they had him picked for that role and everybody leaps on it. As soon as you put that out in the air, everybody wants to believe something like that. Bad person brought it here from bad country, you. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> That's where religion comes from, is the need for an explanation that doesn't exist. Um, so we can blame God, you know, <laughs> or the devil, um, or in this case, um, some poor flight attendant. But the myth, the Gaetan myth separates from the science. It's a whole separate thing, you know. It's not what it's about. It's not about science. It's about projecting ideas of sickness and disease and evil onto somebody, you know. There's a scapegoat. He's, he's a classic scapegoat, you know. And it's weird because nobody knows what he's being scapegoated for. Originally, he was the out-of-California case, you know, and then he's like the first man with AIDS or the man who brought it to America or who knows what he is. He's like the mysterious evil character. He's a scapegoat. Every society needs scapegoats. It's universal, right? It's a magical way of getting rid of evil. You put it on the scapegoat, then you drive it out, and it dies. Takes the evil with it. I think the the application of morality to uh, a disease is a mistake because it interferes with the ability to deal with it. Um, it's a scientific phenomenon. It's a it's a human tragedy, no matter where it is and who gets it. First of all, the people who were religious, you know, Christian fundamentalists, whatever they were called then, um, they believed this was a punishment from God. They believe that. They believe these things. These things that they say, they believe. I mean, this may be, you know, a function of my own uh, personality, which is, I just don't care what other people do. I don't care. You believe in all this crazy religious stuff? Go ahead, but don't impose it on me. Anal sex in particular, had been for so long demonized, the sodomy. We have, we have laws which specifically demonize anal sex. And then for us to have, at great cost, thrown off the shackles of that, and then to see anal sex in particular demonized once again as the best transmission method for what became known as HIV. Um, these sort of realities have a terrible impact on self-image, have a terrible impact on how we how we navigate our sex lives, let alone how a mass public takes up our sex lives. And I do believe homosexuality is a moral perversion. 
participates in every kind of bloody and filthy uh, kind of sexual activity. One of the terms I remember used a lot was general public. General public was people who were innocent of the kinds of practices that gay men were, quote, indulging in. One of the words I saw a lot in the media, one of the words that I identify with homophobia. Somehow gay men indulge in sex. Other people don't indulge in sex. Of course it was tragic when a young child got HIV from a blood supply, but it was also tragic when a 19-year-old man got HIV from a sexual encounter. Patient Zero uh, was very helpful to us in a number of ways. One, he was very open about his sexual partners, which allowed Bill Darrow to do the work that led to the cluster creation. He also agreed to come to Atlanta to give a large amount of blood, thinking if anybody has a new virus, he has it. Well, for several years, we had a conversation between myself, Mike Warby, who's a molecular phylogeneticist at the University of Arizona, saying, let's try to figure out what patient zero represents. Was he really the first case? How does he tie into the early epidemic? So Mike Warby agreed to do genetic sequencing on some very early samples that we collected. I think it was Harold who said, you know, we've got the patient zero samples as well, and why not look at those? And, and for, for me, you know, someone who does this sort of evolutionary stuff, patient zero has never been a thing. It's always been clear that, um, as I say, he was just you know, one of lots of people who were infected. There has been an idea that he may have been the, the conduit that connected the early epidemic, let's say in New York City, to, to the West Coast. Well, it's not. His, his is sort of a typical New York City sequence, and there are other sequences, early sequences from New York City that are much closer to the West Coast uh, from nameless individuals that we're not talking about or making films about. And then what we did, uh, generated the sequence from patient zero. We put that into the family tree, and it just fell randomly in the middle. You would expect from evolutionary theory that if a, if a sample was the founder, that it would form a base branch to the tree. Um, when it doesn't, that means that it is not the founder. It was just an average, mundane HIV subtype B from the time. And with patient zero, Gaetan Dugas in particular, um, you know, I, I didn't realize until Harold Jaffe told me that he made a special trip to, to CDC in Atlanta uh, really just to um, uh, donate samples. I find it remarkable that this guy did this and he, he's emerged into our consciousness as something special in large part because he helped epidemiologists who were trying to figure out what was going on. Very unfortunate because people interpreted that zero to be the starting point of the epidemic. And this person, who had nothing to do with starting this epidemic, was accused of being the source, which was never our intent, never meant to be. I think the, the, the crucial contribution Gaetan Duca made was his very act of cooperation in a moment of extreme fear when he's French Canadian, he could have been deported, but he's going to Atlanta when he's very ill. He's going to San Francisco to meet with the, the researchers. Gaetan Duga really was crucial to us understanding that AIDS was a sexually transmitted disease, and therefore he should be acclaimed as a hero of the epidemic, of the fight against AIDS. <laughs> 